Kailash's situation in Kailash Hill. And now it's described how the two sons of Kuvera took advantage of that nice situation to enjoy sense gratification. Now the description of the forests uh, in the heavenly planets, it's similar to other descriptions of we find in the Bhagavatam and elsewhere of the ashrams of rishis. Just like we, in the third canto we, of the Bhagavatam, there is a description of the ashram of Kada Muni. So it's described very nice with flowers and birds and on the, on the bank of the Bindu Sarova. We find also in the Ramayana there are descriptions of the uh, forest scenes where many rishis would live. But there, uh, living among the rishis, or uh, in the same kind of setting, were also great demons who were used to disturb the rishis and eat, even eat them, kill them and eat them. So generally we say that uh, this uh, nice mode of goodness situation, that is very suitable for spiritual advancement, but it can also be used for material sense gratification. If we see a mode of goodness, the, the forest, the trees, the river, the lake, but actually all the, it's full of living beings who are in the lower modes, of, in the mode of ignorance. The trees, the, the animals, they're, they're in the mode of ignorance. Even that uh, description is there of, of uh, who is that, Surabhi Muni, was it? Yeah. Who, uh, he was in the Yamuna, which is not simply in the mode of goodness, but the, the transcendental river, the mode beyond the modes of nature, should the Sattva people go to Yamuna, they bathe in the Yamuna for purification. But within the Yamuna he saw a fish mating, so the desire came up in his mind because he wasn't firmly fixed in spiritual consciousness. The same example, the Ganga, of course there are so many fish in the Ganga. So that example is given that people go to the Ganga to bathe, to get purified, but the fish there in the Ganga, they don't, it's not that they're all great rishis, they're, they're from, their whole life is bathing in the Ganga, but they're still in fish consciousness. And other people go to Ganga to catch the fish. You'll find in Bihar, so many fish are caught in Ganga and they're sent down to Bengal. For Bengali people, they like to eat fish more, so some people are going to the Ganga for the uh, for the, the performing sinful activity, killing fish, making a business out of it. So everything depends upon one's consciousness. One, one can also, it's a, it's seen around the other way, one can also be in a very horrible, degraded situation be, and actually be a very saintly person. There's that, that saying, is there, Prabhupada quoted in one of his purports that uh, Jadi nityananda shura bari jai, tatapi ho shai mor nityananda rai. Even if I see nityananda Prabhu going into a wine shop, I would still worship him as my respectable Lord Nityananda. Because if he goes to a wine shop, it's understood he's not become a drunkard. He's gone there to, he has some specific purpose, but probably to save the wine drinkers, to give them some Krishna consciousness. Sometimes our devotees also, in the course of distributing books, sometimes they go into bars, sometimes into brothels. But it's not that they go there to become sinful, but they go there to purify the sinful people. So everything depends on the mental condition. This is like a sutra. Everything spiritual and material depends on one's mental condition. What do you want? Ultimately, what is our attitude in spiritual life? The same thing, someone may join a spiritual organization, but not for spiritual reasons, or maybe for, for mixed reasons. One may join because, someone may join because his heart is thirsting to serve Krishna. And someone may join because, well, it's one way of maintaining the body. And there may be mixed motives. Someone may be pious, yes, I like to serve Krishna, but I also have my own motives. So mostly everyone, or no, I, no one's, very few, few people are pure devotees, so most people have some mixed kind of motive. Even the 
even one may not even recognize one's own motive to enjoy but that may be a subtle subtle that may come out later therefore Chaitanya Mahabra warns that Nishida cha kuti nati jive hinshan lava puja patishta jata uprashaka gone he warns about the weeds that can choke the plant the creeper of pure devotional service such as not following the regulated principles diplomacy and politics you wouldn't think that a thing could enter into a spiritual organization but we find that every spiritual organization is pretty much full of it then kutinati jive hinshan cruelty nastiness violence to other living beings then desire for material gain honor respect all in the name of spiritual love so these are why do these things come about people they vow to join the Christian conscious movement they give up gross sense gratification is they're supposed to no meat eating no gambling no tea coffee intoxication any such thing so sometimes you find that even people they join this movement still they're going on with some of these things but even those who give up these things and whose whose desire is to serve Krishna they may be involved also in uh, some kind of political maneuvering or uh, desire for honor because the, the inner desire comes out we've heard this saying that power corrupts even a good person can become corrupted by power but actually one devotee recently wrote, to, recently wrote to me he said that actually power doesn't corrupt but the, if someone is given that opportunity then the corruption that was already within the heart that comes out it's an interesting analysis it's, if, if someone's actually pure then they're not going to be corrupted by power by the opportunity power what does that mean? that means the, 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 there's an opportunity to exploit others and this whole material universe is the place of exploitation everyone is trying to exploit everyone else there's so many I and mean, even in the animal kingdom you see the, the, the <coughs> there's the famous spider black widow spider that after after mating with the male, she eats him. <laughs> so, this is a very, very gross example. But everyone is trying to exploit everyone else. And even we see that people may act very nicely with others, but their, their ultimate aim is to get something out of them, to use them for their own advantage. So we're, we're in the world of exploitation. So as long as we're not fully purified, that desire to exploit others, to promote oneself is there. So, it may be that that, that corruption within the heart it has the opportunity to come out. It's very dangerous. Spiritual life is... Shurak Jadara. It's, just, uh, it's like, just like being on the, on the edge of a razor. With a razor you can shave very nicely, or you can also cut yourself. So by chanting Hare Krishna, you can also uh, become purified. But you can also you can also commit offenses. And in, in one sense, Krishna consciousness it's it's more dangerous even than material life because you come in contact with Vaishnavas and you have the opportunity to offend them, which is more dangerous than offending ordinary living beings. If you offend a Vaishnava, it's more dangerous. So, in one sense, Krishna consciousness is more more dangerous than being an ordinary karma. And also because you get spiritual knowledge, then in that situation if you misuse, in that situation you become more responsible. Just like the example that if someone is dying, uh, the doctor he should help them. If he doesn't, then he becomes more responsible. Or if, they, or if they learn, people become more shocked if they hear that someone is engaged in some simple activity, maybe some illicit sex or whatever, then that's very bad. But if they hear that someone like that, a teacher or someone who's supposed to be a respectable person, sadhu. If people hear sadhu is engaged in this and sex, they become most disgusted. Anyway, it's disgusting. But if sadhu does that, it's more disgusting because he's supposed to be to have spiritual knowledge, to be an emblem of purity. So if a, if a devotee, if someone who has spiritual knowledge, who knows what is right and what is wrong, if he engages in sinful life, that is more 
sense it's more simple. So in one sense coming to Krishna consciousness it's, uh, it's more dangerous that, that knowledge brings responsibility and more responsibility to act in a proper way. Especially when you take the vow. No meat eating, no illicit sex, no intoxication, no gambling. You take a vow, if you don't, if you, if you, after taking that vow you don't follow, then it's better you didn't take the vow in the first place. Because you become more implicated. That apart from the effect of sin, anyway it's sinful, but having specifically vowed not to do it, and having got the knowledge of why you shouldn't be doing it, it becomes more sinful. So, uh, we should see, be very careful. Now we're talking about those who are on the path of Krishna consciousness but may become fallen. There are others also who, in the name of being Krishna conscious, they're, they're just fallen right from the beginning. They, they just make a show of being a devotee for the sake of some personal gain. That Bhakti no Thakur sang that song that uh, Galai Nala, Nakai Tila Galai Nala, A A Kali Chala. He coined this phrase. Kali Chala means a disciple of Kali. Says that he has tilak on his nose, nala on his throat, on his neck. But he's not a disciple of Krishna. He's a disciple of Kali. Very strong statement. Very very strong statement. That uh, and he goes on to describe that he's running with other people's wives. Sometimes you see that. You know, uh, previously in India, there was uh, people were very strict about this: no illicit sex, no meat eating, no intoxication, no gambling. I heard recently in Saurashtra, one couple were found engaging in illicit sex, and they were beaten and beaten to death, beaten and stoned to death. Now I am someone read in the newspapers. They were caught. So uh, previously, these things were very much eschewed in Indian culture. But religion, you know, people were very much concerned with religion. So, if someone wants to engage in illicit sex, meeting, eating, gambling, how to do it? Without being socially, without being socially rejected, you do it in the name of religion. That's what people used to do. Then, then you'll find the guru, he'll teach that, you see Shastra says that everything should be offered to the guru. So, when anyone gets married, First, the daughter, the, the, the new wife, should be offered to the guru, and then you can enjoy prasad. <laughs> they promote such things. Such things are going on here in Gujarat, actually. So there was some controversy that came to the court. So there are so many things you'll find that we have to, you see, we have to eat fish. So, you know, we're very strict Vaishnavas. We don't eat anything without offering it first to Krishna. So first, before you are off, before you take the fish, you have to offer to Krishna with Tulsi. This is going on in Bengal. No, I, I haven't seen previously, it must have been previously. I, and people told me, I never came in contact with such people. And you see, you know, people they are doing Gopi Leela, and so many things. Krishna is doing Gopi Leela, we are followers of Krishna, we should do as Krishna is doing, like this. So many things are going on. In the name of religion. Now they don't have to do it in the name of religion, because it's, they're just doing anyway. Now they have the Western idea. The Western ideas have come that anyway, well, you get married, and if you don't like your wife, well, you know, try her out for some time, and then it's no good. Well, you can always get another. One. Actually, that's allowed in Indian culture. You can always get another one. But now they have this idea: no, you should only marry one wife. And so they, they you try out one wife, and then you get another one. But in Indian culture. You take, you can, you, originally in Hindu culture you can take more than one wife, but now they ban this. No, no, you should only have one wife. And then there's so many divorces and remarriages and all nonsense. And here in Gujarat we still find people, plenty, with two wives. Our Jai Mahadavda, his father died recently. But he had two wives. It's, uh, what's that, Kaka in London? He has, he, is, he lives in one village, I can't remember his name just now. He also has two wives. 
So it's, in, it's considered normal, especially if the, the first wife doesn't have any children or doesn't have any male children. That was allowed. But now they have the idea, no, no, you should only have one wife. It's only allowed. And then they uh, divorce and it becomes very simple. Or they have a mistress. In the Western country, things, but they think it's very bad to have more than one wife. But they, but they are. If you have a mistress, that's that's, that's socially respectable. But to have more than one wife, what nonsense! I think. Uh, Western ideas, as to quote Prabhupada, this is one of the one of the quotes that our liberal, academic, highly educated rascals who call themselves devotees and who are members of ISKCON they criticize Prabhupada as saying that. Prabhupada says that Western, Western things means all bad ideas. So our Western educated PhDs, they don't like this kind of statement. They, they, now there's a new theory going around that well, when Prabhupada gives spiritual instruction, you can accept it. But if he says anything material, then no, you have to judge it with your own intelligence, your own stupid intelligence, which has been spoiled by so many years in the colleges and they think they're a big PhD and they think they're more intelligent than Prabhupada, they're rascals. This is an example of someone who may be posing as a spiritually advanced person, but they're rascals because they're criticizing Prabhupada. Who are they to criticize Prabhupada? If Prabhupada, if Prabhupada says that Western ideas is all bad ideas, then it's correct. And anyway, whether you can see that anyway, everything, Western, what is Western culture? It simply means Cat and dog life. There's no, uh, there's no idea of spiritual advancement. No such thing. Simply, any whole uses it. That is Western culture. It doesn't matter. Man to man, woman to woman, whatever it is. If you find a hole, get it. Get a hold of it. Use it. So it's disgusting. It's, uh, kill, the, kill your mother. Kill your mother and eat. This is Western India. Kill the cow. So, uh, this, this we're studying, studying Srimad Bhagavatam. We're not studying Time magazine or some Eric from some one of our members of this one. I think he's thrown out of this one. But he's written so many books with the theories of Eric from. He probably from says this, from says that, as if, yeah, who is this guy, some meat-eating atheist, as if he's supposed to be some authority, because he's analyzed religions and how they work and how they don't work, and so we have to take his opinion, because he's some kind of psycho-sociologist. Psych who are these people? Why, why do we have to take these opinions? Why, you see, Srila Prabhupada, he was always speaking, he was always quoting Shastra, isn't it? He wasn't quoting, well, according to Eric Fromm, and sometimes he may quote, Napoleon says that uh, impossible is a word in a fool's dictionary, but then he doesn't bring out, you know, for the next, now we're going to do a seminar one month on the sayings of Napoleon. No, no such thing. Daily, Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, this is our authority. If someone, if some materialistic person says something which is, acceptable according to we may quote but not that we take their whole theory no that's another nonsense rascal that, that by which you become another Kali Chala in the name of spiritual life you're saying, you, you want to interpret the Shastra or interpret the Acharya according to some meat-eating Kami ideas or you do some study and you yes according to this study the Shastra is wrong what nonsense uh, why I don't know why these people even join this movement. If you don't believe in Shastra, if you don't accept Shastra, then what are you? Why are you even in the Hare Krishna movement? Go back to your stupid university and become a scholar and sit with them and smoke cigarettes and do whatever they do and uh, you know live happily ever after and go to hell, which is where you're going anyway if you criticize Shastra. Now, why pose as a devotee? Devotee means. Guru, Sadhu, Shastra, Vakya, Chitete, Kariya, Oika, Ana, Kariya, Manayasya. We simply accept what is given by Guru, Sadhu and Shastra. That is our standard. Every day we're singing. We 
come before Prabhupada. Guru Mokapadna Vaka Chitete Kore Ana Kore Amanehas. We worship the words of the Guru. As a, as a physical point, as, as an external manifestation, we worship the lotus feet of the Guru. But actually more important than the feet is the mouth, what he says. If you're simply worshipping the feet but you don't follow the instruction, that's meaningless. You have to follow the instruction, you have to listen, what does he say? Sadhu is understood by what he says, not according to his feet. That you go, if you want to find a guru, what is the system? You don't go around inspecting their feet. Who has got nice feet? Who's got the most pretty feet? Who's got, you know, nice, nice uh, soft skin? That's not the matter. You hear what they say. You understand the sadhu by what he says. So, what the, what the Guru says, that is worshipable because he only speaks of Krishna. And he, of course, you, I mean, you may find some rascals also speaking of Krishna. There are so many people making a living by speaking about Krishna. But who speaks about Krishna in such a way that we can also become Krishna conscious. That is Guru Mukhlefa, Guru Mukha Padma Vaka, Chitete Kareya. We, we worship the words of the Guru. For those who want to analyze, well, is it actually correct, or maybe it's wrong, and probably it is wrong, and we don't like all these things he says, that especially that women should be submissive to men, we don't like that at all. And they say, well, maybe Prabhupada was influenced by, you know, he was brought up in a very traditional, conservative Indian background, and therefore he was influenced by that. Therefore, we don't have to take it seriously. Oh, what nonsense. This is Shastra. Throughout Shastra, why Prabhupada is saying that? Because uh, Shastra says, and then they say, well, this is from Manu. Well, Manu, the Western the theorists and the modern Indian academic, so-called academics, they say that Manu, he was, he was just uh, promoting the Brahmins. He was a Brahmin fanatic and he put down the lower caste. No. Shastra is benevolent. Krishna is benevolent, he's not ex exploiting anyone. When they hear that someone should be higher than someone else, immediately in their, in their stupid democratic, so-called democratic the way they say, well, everyone is equal. You don't think that anyone should be superior to anyone else. This is all nonsense. Practically speaking, no one follows such a thing. Even in America, they're proud of their democracy. But the, the president is giving the speech on TV. They don't call... They don't call any just idiot off the street, off the street. They call the idiot from the White House and put him and let him speak. Not any idiot, but uh, the elected idiot, king of the fools. So it's understood that he's in a superior position. Well, if you go for a job, you see, you go to the factory and you have to press the button, or press this button, press that button, hammer in a sequence all day. And they say, well, we'll give you uh, 1,500 rupees a month for doing this. You say, what? How much are you earning? You're the director of the country. Well, I'm, le I'm earning one lakh 50,000 a month. So why? Why don't you give me the same? Democracy is all the same. You should give me the same way. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as equality. It's another bogus idea. People in the Western countries, they think, oh, it's a, uh, equality. Egality, what is that, the French Revolution? Egalité, liberté, fraternité. We should all be equal and liberal and brothers. It's all rubbish. There's no such... Someone is more intelligent than someone else. Someone is more powerful than someone else. That is there in human societies, there in animal societies, there even in plant societies. That one plant is stronger than another. So the Van Ashram system that recognizes the differences and structure society that there will be, it will be organized nicely with no exploitation. The problem is not that one is superior to another, the problem is that one is exploiting another. They have, they've seen there's a problem because in, in the Western countries you had all these kings who are simply exploiting the citizens as Srimad Bhagavatam predicts that, uh, what is that? Mlecharajanyavati. Uh, hmm? What is that? Mlecharajanyavati. Mlecha, yes. Prajaste Bhakshishyanti Mlecharajanyavati. That Mlechas, meat eaters, lowest class rascals, 
taking the form of kings, taking the position of kings, they'll simply consume the citizens, literally eat. The word is eat. It means that they'll, they'll exploit them. Sometimes you even find some, there was that Idi Amin in Uganda, he literally ate, it's literally ate his citizens. He used to, his political enemies, he, after killing them, he used to eat them. Hare Krishna. Is he still alive? I don't know. You're from there, right? Uganda? Is he still alive, that guy? So that was going on, therefore they pulled, no, no more king. Now we'll have democracy or communism. Rule of the people, by the people, and everyone is equal. We saw Brezhnev, he was the, the, the head of the USSR, communist. And then he had, what, 70 sports cars. He wasn't exactly equal with everybody else. He had, a, he had a collection of sports cars. Whereas most people in the USSR, they didn't have any car. How can they have a car? They're all equal. They all have nothing. <laughs> they all have nothing. You know. On behalf of the state, the president of the state is looking after these 70 sports cars and a big palace. We're all equal, but on behalf of the state, I'm doing some extra service. So of looking after extra money and all these things. So it's, uh, it's not possible. Even in a communist society, that someone has to be the manager and someone has to be the worker, like this. So, uh, what Shastra is giving, that is perfect. That is the first condition by which someone should come to Krishna consciousness. If at all, I mean, you shouldn't even get initiated if you don't accept this, that you have to follow Shastra. And if you don't, they, they don't want to accept Shastra, then why, why accept anything? Here we're, we're reading the description of Mandakini Ganga. The Ganga in the heavenly planets. It's the same river as the Ganga here, just a little bit north of here. That flows through from Gangotri to down to Kanpur and then through to Allahabad, Varanasi and down through Bihar, Bengal and to Ganga Saga. Same Ganga. How can you say the same Ganga in the heavenly planets as on the earth planet? What is the explanation? Because the Ganga is carried in spaceships from the heavenly planets to the Himalayas. That is the description in Bhagavatam. You don't want to accept it? Then get the hell out of here. Get back to your university. This is Shastra. You have to accept it. You, don't, you, never, you can't believe it? Well, don't believe it. You don't have to. But then don't pretend to be a devotee because we, devotee means he has to accept Shastra. You, you, you don't believe it, you never saw such a thing. What does it matter you never saw such a thing? How much have you seen in this universe? What do we know of this universe? We're tiny, tiny little beings in a vast universe and we have some PhD and we think, oh, I'm such a... Now I'm more intelligent than Vyasadhi. Now I'm more intelligent than Krishna. Krishna's, Krishna says that uh, now now I'm just good, you know, or anything. You think, oh, why, why Prabhupada is speaking in such, such harsh terms? Prabhupada, when he was asked, he said, I'm only saying what Krishna says. If Krishna says, those who don't surrender to me are rascals. So the duty of Guru is to repeat what Krishna says. So that is a fact. Anyone who's, who is not surrendered to Krishna, he is a rascal. What is, how can you say that? Because Krishna says, that is Krishna's opinion. Who is to say? Who is good or who is bad? You have in modern philosophy all this kind of, well, how can you define what is good? Actually, nothing is good, nothing is bad. Yes, there is a difference between good and bad. Good means those who surrender to Krishna, and bad means those who don't surrender to Krishna. There is a difference. It's not all the same. Or they try to define good and bad in their own, by their own yardstick. So someone says abortion is good, and someone says abortion is bad, how are they to judge? You can't, by your own materialistic way, you can't judge. They'll say, well, actually it's good if you have an abortion because you see a child, you don't want the child, and there's not enough money to look after it, so better have an abortion. It's kind to the child. If you, if you have the child, it's not good. Or someone may say that actually it, you should teach, there's another of these weird theories, that float around in our ISKCON by people who don't read Prabhupada's books or don't have faith in them. But actually, you see, the children of our devotees 
they're going to have illicit sex anyway, so better tell them to use contraceptives so they don't get AIDS and they don't have children who are not unwanted. Very good theory. Very excellent theory. No, you know, Prabhupada is preaching to all the hippies. He never said, well, you know, you better use contraceptives when you have sex because you may have children that you don't want and then they'll become criminals. He never said any such thing. He said, no illicit sex. If you don't follow that, then you're simply an animal. That's all. No. So, he never said any such thing. No such compromise. No illicit sex. No, no contraceptives. No such thing. So, this uh, Krishna consciousness, how, what is actual following means to follow the Acharya, to follow Guru Sadhu Shastra, not to become artificially more intelligent. Or so many theories that Prabhupada, he didn't really understand the Western people. He understood much better than you. You don't want to understand his understanding because you want to remain a Western rascal with contraceptives and so many things. It just is typical of cheating religion. Dharma projita kaitava atra. Srimad Bhagavatam begins that cheating religion is kicked out here. And Prabhupada, practically this verse describes Prabhupada's mission. Dharma projita kaitava atra. Paramo niyamat saranam satam vedyam vastav atra vastu shivadam tapatrayam nuranam Srimad Bhagavata mahamuni kriti kimba para vishvaram. Sadhya Hridya Varudya Tetra Kativisa Sushidhi Takshanat. This verse practically describes what is Prabhupada's mission. To kick out cheating religion from the world. To bring people to the platform of Paramahamsa, non-envious, so they can appreciate what is Srimad Bhagavatam, Niyamatsuram Sutra. To give the absolute truth, Vedyam Vastavam Atra Vastu. This is the actual truth of the, the, the of the Vedas. After the last two, Shiva, which is uh, all auspicious, which uproots the threefold miseries. This Srimad Bhagavatam was, is the topmost philosophical contribution. Prabhupada is giving the topmost philosophical contribution to human society. Topmost philosophical contribution because it is compiled by Vedas in his maturity. Therefore, what is the need for any other scripture? Even what is the need for any other scripture? What to speak of? What is the need for mundane, stupid, psycho psychoanalytical theories? There's no need for any other scripture, then there's certainly no need for any, any theory concocted out of the three modes of material nature by people who are Brahmama, Vipralipsa, Karana, Patav, Arya, Vidya, Vakya, Nahido, Sheshav. Why do we follow the, why do we accept the Shastras? Why do we accept why do we worship the words of the Acharya? Because they follow the words of scripture and they are free from the, mistake, the defects of the conditioned souls which are uh, mistakes in perfect senses, the tendency to be an illusion and a, a cheating propensity. Therefore we worship the words of the Acharya. We worship the words of Shastra because they are beyond these defects. They are all perfect. Srimad Bhagavatam is... is uh, all perfect. So we're, this is Prabhupada's mission to kick out. If Prabhupada said, my mission is to destroy atheism. This is Prabhupada's idea. And now we want to import atheism. That now we have to, instead of listening to the Acharya, they'll say, who, who doesn't really know what he's talking about, we should, we should make a study in the university and take interviews with different people and get their opinions. All rubbish. Everything, you take all these philosophers in the world, all your Freuds and your Kants and your Nitzis and your Sartres and Russells and they're all just, just what you can do with their books, you can make a nice bonfire and keep yourself warm. That's the best thing to do with their books. Or even better, you can reprocess their books and use for reprinting. You can print Prabhupada's books. they all rubbish. You take one line from Prabhupada's book, it's, everything is perfect. No valuable that after years and years and years of ignorance, simply speaking, all rubbish. They have no idea that even the first lesson of spiritual life in the Western countries, that you're not the body, they have no idea. Everything is simply on the physical and mental platform. They have no idea, they're not even anywhere near the absolute truth. The absolute truth is to be understood first 
before you even come to the platform of understanding the absolute truth, you have to understand we are not the body, we are eternal spirit soul. They didn't even they didn't even get in the kindergarten of Vedic knowledge. They didn't even get that far. And philosophy their their philosophy is like the philosophy of a of a screaming baby. With it. Exactly like that. Because the philosophy you can begin to understand when the first there has to be some sense control. Without sense control, how can you understand the highest truth? But without sense control, a human being is just like an animal or, a, or an untrained screaming baby. So they're exactly on that platform, these so-called philosophers of the Western world, that they may be so-called highly intelligent and advanced, but actually they, have, they don't understand anything whatsoever. They're just on the animal platform. So we're taking knowledge from Srimad Bhagavatam, such perfect knowledge. His best, actually if you need, if you want knowledge, we have to come to Shastra. There's so much good. Even uh, Shastra, the different Acharyas, they've given so many wonderful insights, just like you see, what a wonderful insight that here Prabhupada is giving. It's not the situation you're in that is most important. More important is your own mental condition. Such an important point that sometimes we think, well, for my spiritual advancement I have to be in this situation or that situation. You may be in the best situation. But if our desire is wrong, then we'll misuse that situation. You can be in the sannyas ashram, which is the most exalted ashram for spiritual life, in which you have nothing to do but to serve Krishna. But you can also, in that ashram, you can also exploit that situation to engage in illicit sex. You can also do because people, they, they, they're giving you all facility, the sannyasi is given all facility so that he can fully concentrate on spiritual life. But if he uses that facility uh, to uh, exploit young women, he can also do it. It's not unheard of. So it's not that automatically, just by being in a situ certain situation, one will become advanced. Someone can, someone can uh, even take sannyas just for the sake of impressing others or suppressing others. You may do. Generally not, we hope. But it's not impossible. Or one may be in uh, family life with surrounded by relatives and completely, uh, even non-devotional relatives and be fully Krishna conscious. The example is there, Prahlad Maharaj. He wasn't in a very, he didn't have very good association. No one among his friends, teachers, father, they were all absolutely against his Krishna consciousness. But he remained pure. So generally we like a good, generally we try to get good association. It's very important for spiritual advancement. But ultimately, more, more important than all these things is one's own attitude. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has recommended that uh, Sadhu Sangha Nama Kirtan Bhagavad Shravan Natura Vas Sri Murti Shadhai Sevan For advancement in Krishna consciousness, five items are particularly important. There are many important things, but particularly he has recommended associating with devotees. Chanting the names of the Lord, hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam, living in Mathura and worshipping the deity with great faith. So all these things are most important for our advancement. But even more, what is, what is the vital factor that will help us to make advancement is our, what is our attitude? Do we want to serve Krishna or do we want to imitate Krishna? Do we, want to, do we want to serve Krishna or do we want others to serve us? So even you may chant Hare Krishna, but if our motive is wrong, we won't make any advancement. It's like pouring petrol on the fire from one side and water from the other. You'll simply get a bunch of smoke, that's all. Whatever, whatever value, whatever benefit you get from one side is nullified from the other. So attitude, that Prabhupada writes, that Advancement in Krishna consciousness depends on the attitude of the performer. The attitude of the devotee should be simply to accept the words of Guru, Sadhu and Shastra 
And to, to follow in their footsteps means the, the, the Shastra describes to us who are the perfect devotees. We should follow in their footsteps, take up their mood. The mood of the perfect devotees is how to please Krishna. That should be adopted. Otherwise in devotional life also, we may be living in the association of devotees, but our, our motive may be, first I'll see, I am satisfied. That is not devotion. Devotion means to see how Krishna is satisfied. Hare Krishna. Is there any question? Hmm. To be near to. Yeah. Mm. Is the comment is that yeah, Prabhupada's right Prabhupada writes the same thing and in Chaitanya Charitamrita Prabhupada, Prabhupada writes that it's actually it can be very dangerous to be close to the deity of the spiritual master because Prabhupada quotes that English saying familiarity breeds contempt so one may make offenses we see that some devotees who are who are very close to Prabhupada they actually became one of the devotees who was traveling with Prabhupada all over the world Nitai, his Sanskrit assistant he became a complete, Prabhupada rejected him. He, is, he sent a letter to all the temples. Nitai has become a snake. Do not allow him into your temple. Because he was reading his Sanskrit books and he thought, oh, Prabhupada's only teaching us the, the very basic things. This is not very, we should have more advanced things. So then he wrote to Prabhupada's letter that please give me your blessings that I can find a bona fide spiritual master. What a rascal. The, 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 the most prominent and merciful spiritual master in, the, in this Kali Yuga and he's writing please give me your blessings I can Prabhupada wrote that he has become a snake do not allow him in any of our sins Prabhupada is very merciful he didn't easily reject people but he rejected these people he rejected this rascal immediately another time there, there was one uh, there was one teacher in Gurukul, headmaster actually of the Gurukul in Mayapur. So he came to Prabhupada once he, with Bhagavad Gita, he'd written in some verse form and he wanted to show it to Prabhupada and ask him, is it suitable for publishing in Back to God? So Prabhupada looked and he said, yes, it's all right. And then for 10 minutes he spoke to him, that don't think you can become more intelligent than your spiritual master. You always have to remain a humble servant. Hari Shari Prabhu was there. And he was wondering, Kari Shari Prabhupada said, he was wondering why is Prabhupada speaking to him like this? He couldn't understand why. And later on, this rascal, he decided that Prabhupada actually he didn't properly know the philosophy and he, 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 he rejected it. Now I have a better, I have taken another spiritual master. He became a complete rascal, complete rogue. So Prabhupada could see that. You have to be very, very careful. Now we've come and the shelter of Prabhupada's lotus feet. You have to be very, very careful not to offend Srila Prabhupada. Now this is going on now in the name of higher studies in our movement. Some so-called devotees, they are criticizing Prabhupada, which is horrible. They think they've become more intelligent. They should be very, 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 careful, very dangerous, very poisonous. Worship Prabhupada, come to his Guru Puja every day, study his books. If there's something you don't understand, well that's why we have spiritual masters also. Prabhupada gave his, he wanted his disciples to be spiritual masters also, that, so they could, if at any point you don't understand, then you clarify, you come, you come with your doubt, get it clarified. But don't just write something, well I, I can't trust Prabhupada because he says this and he says that and spew your vomit all over the world. If you want to vomit, go in the toilet and vomit privately. But don't do it, don't do it all over everyone's, all over everyone's clothing, in everyone's face. face. <laughs>